Your Humanities Half Hour is brought to you by the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Welcome to Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry, and today we're talking about language, specifically Chamorro and Carolinian language. And joining us today is Professor Dr. Thomas Stoltz of the University of Bremen in Germany. How is that, Thomas? Yes, it was okay. The last name perfectly pronounced. Thank you very much. Not sure if I can replicate that, but... Um, <laughs> I'm trying my best for the linguist in the studio today. Welcome back to the Marianas. This is not your first trip. No, it's the second trip to uh, the Northern Marianas. I was uh, on Guam also before, so it's my third trip to the Marianas now. All right. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's always interesting to talk to you because you bring a an international perspective to obviously something very dear to our hearts here, which is our own language. Yeah. Um, what are the projects uh, you're working on this time around? Yeah, there are two projects. Um, uh, one is uh, concerned with place names and the other one is more general. So uh, um, let's say a real genuine linguistic project uh, on certain categories. I can mention them later, I think, yeah. Okay, yeah, we'll talk about that one in the second half of the mm -hmm. show. But what is this project about place names about? Yeah, well, place names uh, form part of uh, the uh, the mental lexicon of people, part of their culture. They the people speaking uh, belonging to a certain community, speech community or cultural community, uh, need uh, words, expressions to refer to places uh, that belong to their domain, their cultural domain, their country, uh, the, the the their vicinity, their neighborhood. neighborhood yeah. yeah, right. And uh, normally you find. Uh, expressions um, uh, names for places on maps for instance so if there is a map of a country uh, let's say England or the Netherlands or uh, South Africa you find place names all over the place of right. course so that people can orient themselves in their home countries Mm, uh, about half a year ago, I had to look at the maps of the Northern Marianas for completely different reasons. It's not important why I looked there, but I found that uh, uh, there are uh, quite a few maps of the Northerly Islands which are practically empty. There are no uh, place names except the island names. So uh, I knew, uh, knew, of course, at that time already that people, these islands weren't always uninhabited. So people right. lived there uh, uh, also for a relatively long period of time and if people live uh, in a place they normally give names to uh, the landmarks in their uh, vicinity on the entire island but there were no names on the maps For, at first I thought yeah okay this is a special kind of map uh, let's have a look at other maps and then it turns out it turned out that there are no maps at all uh, uh, which uh, host uh, place names for the northerly islands of the Northern Marianas, except Pagan. So the Pagan, there are names, because it was the most populated island, for, uh, for instance. And still and, and, uh, yeah, today. Yeah. yeah, but for the other islands, there are no names. Uh, so uh, I asked people here at the Humanities Council whether they knew about uh, the names. Is there a list of names? Uh, is there an official list uh, of names, approved names and so on? You find these kinds of institutions uh, in other countries. So all over the world you would find something um, that is a kind of inventory of the place names uh, for certain regions. But there is nothing. Have Nothing. you ever encountered this before, looking at... No, that's system? the first case, that uh, uh, in a country that has uh, inhabited parts or formerly inhabited parts, there are no names for these in these parts. This is a very... F it's exceptional. I wouldn't claim that there is no other case in the world because I don't know all the cases. But as far as the, the, the many cases I know for the place name research, that's the first I, I ever uh, encountered so that's uh, really exceptional and there must be a reason for this ex uh, exception what is the linguistic uh, curiosity in helping the Marianas identify our, our place names 
Yes, I think uh, it's like uh, losing your words in your everyday language. If you don't have words for certain objects, uh, for instance, let's say uh, Chamorro is your native language, uh, uh, but you have forgotten how certain objects are uh, um, called in your language, you use English as a replacement for the forgotten Chamorro terms. Um, so you can find uh, uh, some way to express your ideas by using uh, another language in your uh, Tamoro discourse. That happens all over the place, no matter what languages uh, are involved. Uh, sometimes people simply have two or three languages at their uh, disposal and can uh, mix them in their discourse. Uh, but in the case of the place names, there are, if you want to refer to a place on these islands now, because they're still part of your country, they're still part of uh, your, um, let's say, psychological domain. And I'm sure there are people out there who know these names. Yes. It's still part of their lives. Yes, I think so. I, we wanted to meet people here uh, uh, for the project and ask them uh, about uh, former residents, for instance, uh, or uh, people who still go there. Uh, and if uh, people still go there and spend some time there, I'm pretty sure that they need to have names for uh, parts of the islands they go because they have uh, uh, to get along on the island and they won't stay only in one house for uh, the entire period. So it's important for us to reconstruct these uh, uh, inventory of place names uh, to be in contact with people who are knowledgeable uh, uh, as to the topography and landscape of these northerly islands. My guess is one of the most popular um, place names that's going to come out are the best fishing spots. Yes, of or course. Or the I coastal think, yeah, areas. Yeah, yeah. Definitely, yeah, yeah. maybe not so much the inland, maybe some mountains, or but definitely yeah. the coastal areas. That, that would be my guess. We, we know uh, that there were villages in the past on some of the islands, and all of them were called Song Song. So that's okay. There you find these <laughs> indications, but it's uh, the the life wasn't restricted to the the villages. So people went out of the village to perhaps to gather things to hunt or whatever. So they there must be uh, there must have been other place names as well, not only the village names, and um, also fishing grounds, of course, and perhaps past of uh, parts of the coastline, uh, beaches uh, where people could uh, put their boats, right. keep their boats, and so on. So there are. Uh, are you, are you saying you've encountered other villages aside from the one on Rota that people have there, referred yeah. to or recall mm, as Songsong? There are two or three islands where there is a possibility for a second village because uh, you find the name Partido uh, several times, uh, at least twice, on two different islands. And uh, it looks like uh, this was a kind of um, offspring of the original uh, 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 village. We don't know where Partido would be on on the map. The, the village, the one village, the official village, Song Song, uh, is indicated on uh, the map without name. It sa just says village. But there has been some kind of branch of the uh, um, out branch in a, in a way of the village uh, that was named Partido. But we don't know where to place this name on the map. It's still a mystery to us. And it's uh, only, uh, let's say, a little bit of uh, informed speculation. It may be something else. I like we that don't word, informed speculation. It's informed speculation. And for a scientist, and uh, it's, uh, it, it's making us nervous to just speculate. We want to know exactly. And to know exactly, of course, we have to talk to people, get the expertise of people who know their way around of, on the islands. Otherwise, it's impossible. We can't do this on our own. Right. No. This kind of reminds me of when I was growing up. I was very confused because people would talk about Telefofo Falls. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, I was confused because I didn't realize there's Telefofo Falls on Guam mm -hmm. and there's Telefofo Falls on Saipan. Yeah. And I'd be like, what's going on? I, I thought they were in Guam. Why are people saying they went to Telefofo Falls this weekend? Mm -hmm. But it's similar to what you're saying about Song Song. Yeah, that's similar to Song Song and Partido as well. And uh, that, But that's not, uh, let's say it's not really exceptional. You find uh, these uh, multiple use of place names also in other countries. Oh, okay. So in my home country, you find uh, 
dozens of Neustadt, for instance. It's uh, a name for a village, town, city, but you can find dozens of it. Oh, okay. It's uh, simply the case that people are sometimes not so creative when they want to name places. So, uh. so um, what ki- how are you going about your research? Um. Yeah, we have finished uh, our, not, not really finished. We have the, the, what we wanted to do this time we have accomplished. So we have organized the research uh, in a way that when we come back next year, hopefully, uh, we can uh, then talk to people who have an experience, personal experience on the islands. And I, I hope that many people uh, could share their knowledge uh, or, um, in connection with the uh, place names on the islands with us. And then the idea is to produce a, a kind of atlas, a, a collection of maps with comments, uh, historical comments and uh, geographical comments and so on, and some linguistic explanations as well, um, uh, to be published uh, in a kind of collective work uh, of the council and our university, uh, to be published and then given to the community so that uh, all people belonging to the community have access to uh, the once forgotten names or hidden names in a way. Perhaps they are not really forgotten, but they are not publicly visible on the maps. And they're not really used because there aren't people going there much anymore, so... It's yeah, but uh, let's say a handful of people are uh, is enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah? yeah. If people go there, they I, I they have names. Perhaps there is uh, the possibility that there are uh, they use ad hoc names. So they they don't use the traditional names, but when they go there, they use names uh, of their own invention. So they make up new names. Uh, for, uh, let's say per- their personal place names because only them are they're on the islands uh, at certain times and they never tell other people that's a possibility about these place names so we don't know whether there are uh, the the old names traditional names are still in use mm-hmm. among those people or there are new names mm-hmm. or, or uh, if they really d- w- would wouldn't use place names of the uh, of the usual kind this would be very exceptional very exceptional then and even that would be interesting to study. I'm assuming there's going to be knowledge contained in some of these names that, you know, like what the place was traditionally known for, yes. that maybe, you know, and if we don't document that, we're going to forget. Yeah, for, for instance, there are some, a few examples of place names which are, let's say, uh, semantically transparent, so you can tell what it means. Right. So, and sometimes the meaning tells you for what purpose a place was used so a certain plant was growing there and you could use it for uh, for your crop for instance or a certain kind of fish could be found there or a certain kind of climate uh, uh, a certain weather uh, uh, um, phenomena could be found uh, or um, uh, uh, are typical of a certain place so there this is uh, encoded in the place names relatively often and sometimes there are, there are personal names as well, so you can tell who owned the wow. place. Hmm? Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm looking here. Uh, you've brought some maps from mm-hmm. the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The one I have here is Agrihan. And, and you're right. Other than Agrihan Island, Northern Mariana Islands, and something that says village, it's completely blank. Yes, and that's typical. All the other maps, except Pagan, are like this. My mom was telling me the other day about how when she spent time on Anatahan as a child, there was a saltwater pool where her her uncle, I think it was, w- they would catch sea turtles and mm-hmm. kind of hold the... You're familiar with this pool. Yeah. I, uh, but there's no... Or at least by the map. By the map, yeah. But there's no, there's, um, no name on the map. No name. And now I'm curious yeah. to ask her if there was a name. Yeah, please do. Please do. Because uh, maybe the name for the uh, uh, saltwater pool was just saltwater po- pool. But even that is okay. Uh, if Song Song means village and it's the name of the village... It's also okay, but it's the name you use if you refer to the place. If you want to go to the saltwater pool and you have to say saltwater pool, <laughs> that's f- still fine. You have no other name for it. That's the name. But perhaps it has a completely different name. It, mm-hmm. I'm curious to uh, know what your mother will say. Unfortunately, it'll probably be in Carolinian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's that another no. project for you. <laughs> Absolutely no problem, because uh, as far as we see from the little 
uh, we know right now from other written sources uh, of n place names used in this no northerly islands, some are Carolinian. Uh, the majority looks tomorrow. Sometimes they are misspelled and so on, and perhaps by, uh, by uh, recorded by people who are not knowledgeable in tomorrow, so they are written in a <laughs> interesting way. But there are also English names, um, and uh, very few, very few. And there uh, are also uh, um, Spanish names, which could also be Chamorro names. But uh, the, the, um, let's say the names we have found in the literature amount to only, let's say, two dozens. And uh, we expect that there must be at least ten times as many. Yeah? And so there is a huge gap to be filled. Yeah. Well, we certainly hope your university will support your continued studies. If they do, what can the people expect the next time you come? The next time we will, of course, uh, present publicly uh, the preliminary results of our research and a plan for uh, the, the f uh, future co uh, collaboration. And then we want to, <laughs> we would appreciate to meet people and uh, interview them about their place name experience with the northern uh, northerly islands because we can't do the uh, re uh, the research we can't continue without the help of the local people all right yeah. so to all our listeners out there if you uh, have knowledge of some of the place names in the northern islands please start documenting that or interviewing your elders and hopefully dr stoltz will be able to come back yeah. And uh, and you can share that information at that time. Yeah, you can even communicate your uh, findings uh, directly to the council here so that uh, the records can be kept until we return to the islands. Very good. We'll be back with uh, his second project after this break. Did you know that you can donate up to $5,000 to the Humanities Council through the CNMI Education Tax Credit Program? Donations from individuals and corporations qualify and can be used to offset your local wage and salary tax, BGRT, and earnings tax. Call our office at 235-4785 to see how you can support humanities programs in our community and obtain a tax credit for your donation. Sizu Usma'asi, Olomai, and thank you. Welcome back to Your Humanities Half Hour. Thomas, the second project that you're working on is part of a, I understand, an international project yeah. looking at some particular words. It's, uh, yeah, Catherine, that's uh, almost f completely correct. It's not about words alone. It's about construction. So that could be uh, a, a, a number of words could be involved. It's about expressions that have to do with possession. That's a, li a term we use for... Uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, categories that are expressed in English by the verb have, having, uh, to have something, somebody has something, or own, somebody owns something, or possess, somebody possesses something, and this is mine, mine, an, an object is mine, uh, my object, uh, my mother's object, and so on. So there is a kind of ownership relation, uh, but uh, also beyond this. In my native language, for instance, it's more or less like English, but not e exactly like English. You can have everything. You can have feelings. You can have illnesses, diseases, ideas, brothers, sisters, uh, vacations, and so on. And it's all the same word? It's uh, all, all the, always it's, uh, the same verb you use. Oh, okay. Uh, whereas in other languages, also in Europe, you can't do this uh, this way. You have to dissect the, the domain into the, the different smaller parts, and you use different expressions for having in this context. In some languages, you can't have diseases, for instance. Mm -hmm. They're on you or in you, ah. and so on. Um People uh, who work in my discipli discipline have been studying this field of possession for quite some time, 40 years, 50 years already, and they put an emphasis on having relations. What can be had? By whom? And in what way is, is it expressed? Um, and then they talk sometimes about the, uh, um, the opposite uh, perspective. Something belongs to somebody. This is also part of uh, possession. But uh, we hardly know anything about this belonging part of the thing because the emphasis was on having. 
And the emphasis was also the focus very much on European languages. So what we know about this uh, uh, domain is very heavily dependent on what we know about European languages. You imagine European ling linguists doing this. They know European languages and then they want to come to conclusions very quickly, jump to conclusions. Then they say, yeah, we know this uh, happens all over the place in Europe, in the European languages. Then it must be the case also for all other languages. And they generalize about human languages, making them uh, look like <laughs> European languages. We know already that it, it's, the situation is different in Micronesia, for instance. We know a little bit about it, just a little bit. And it's so different that uh, already that we could um, use the Micronesian evidence to revise the entire theory. So the, the Micronesian data are very important to be studied in detail uh, in order to show that the extant uh, theory about possession in human languages is not entirely correct. It has to be changed. It's not only that the Micronesian data are simply added to what we already know. The data would require the linguists to change their uh, uh, their point of view. But in order to trigger this change, we have to study the Micronesian da 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 data in detail. Are you able to, to give us an idea at this point how the Micronesian languages mm -hmm. are different? Yesterday we had a meeting with uh, speakers, uh, native speakers of five different Micronesian languages, Marsha and Chamorro, Carolinian, Chuk, uh, Palawan, and Marshallese. Uh, and uh, several of the teachers and women uh, told us, yeah, in our language, uh, we don't make the, uh, this distinction between own and possess and have. We all have uh, just one uh, expression for all of these uh, typically English uh, distinctions. And this is something that other people, my, my colleagues, <laughs> not other people, my, my colleagues claim that uh, it doesn't exist, this kind of general expression covering all of the possessive relations. So this is already a new experience for us. We had um, the idea that it's possible, perhaps, that Micronesian languages behave in this way, but we had no really tangible proof for it. What made you think it was possible? That I, I had a look at some uh, Chamorro publications, books in Chamorro for, um, uh, let's say, for, for schools, uh, dating back to the 1970s, and I read the passages, made the translations, and there were contexts where... Uh, uh, Let's say uh, it's a concrete example. A, a, a young girl has found a cat and she's asking around to whom the cat belongs. What she says is, who has the cat? Who has the cat? Who has the cat? So she has to ask this several times because there are different people around and so on. And in the English translation, it only makes sense to ask to whom does the cat belong? Yes. Or whose cat who is it? Yeah. yeah. Who, who owns? Cats is yeah, it? yeah. Perhaps who owns? But what she asks is, uh, who has the cat? Who has the cat? And it's the most natural way to do it, as far as I see. For Chamorro speakers, there is no term, hmm. direct equivalent of English "belong," and that's not a, f uh, let's say, a shortcoming. Or I think that's a possible way to organize this possessive s system. And this is a situation that is unexpected. Linguists didn't expect that there is no separate expression for belonging. And it's important to describe this. You know, I think in, in Micronesian culture, a lot of, of ownership mm -hmm. is, is collective versus yes. individual. Yeah. Do you think that has an influence on, on the use of this, this term? Well, the possibility exists but we still don't know how strong the correlation is between social, uh, the social idea uh, concept of possession and the linguistic uh, concept of possession. It's probable that it is rather, uh, rather strong. Uh, there are, let's say, there are communities where there is no, no visible connection between the social idea of what belongs to whom and how it is expressed in language. So they're, uh, they're relatively liberal <laughs> about this. But then there is evidence, but it's not really hard evidence uh, yet. We still have to check this, uh, that there is a much closer tie between the social 
or cultural view of possession and the linguistic realization uh, in terms of expressions. In order to answer your question definitely, we first have to collect the data. Mm -hmm. I think perhaps it's in, 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 the, uh, in the Pacific, it's generally different from what we have, for instance, in, in Europe. You, you mentioned you were reading a, a book in Chamorro mm -hmm. or reviewing. How many languages do you know? Or oh, do you that's have a question I don't like to. Some familiarity <laughs> with. <laughs> no, yeah, a linguist has, uh, yeah, uh, uh, let's say, ideally, a linguist ha uh, doesn't have to know many languages. He just, uh, he or she, as just uh, to know uh, the tools how to analyze languages. So that's, uh, um, uh, that's a possibility that somebody who just knows his or her native language uh, plus one or two others could do work on any other language. So that you have to know this. We don't have to speak the languages. Uh, um, you just need to know we, how it works? Yes, right? because it's, it's like uh, being a judge or something like this. You don't have to commit the crimes. You have to <laughs> 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 in, in a way, you, you just have to, <laughs> to come to conclusions uh, and you have your tools for this. Uh, it, and it's like this. I, I, I read Chamorro. To, to the, I don't speak it because yes. I uh, would have to... Um, have the opportunity to uh, do conversation. But of course, with the help of a dictionary and a grammar, you can sit down and you have your, uh, your technical knowledge as a linguist in the back of your mind. You can start and then analyze the language. And it's, uh, well, let's say fairly accurate what we're doing. I, I, I imagine maybe it's something like being able to read or write computer code. Yeah, it's L similar. Like if you know the rules and you have a talent for it, then it comes easier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. In your studies of the Chamorro and, and Carolinian uh, mm -hmm. languages, is there anything in particular that stands out as interesting or memorable? First of all, I, 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 I complain about something. Yeah, uh, I start sure. with complaining about the fact that, uh, to my knowledge, there is uh, as yet no uh, reference grammar of Carolinian. There is a dictionary, but we are still looking forward to the publication of a description of the language as to its grammar. Uh, for tomorrow, the situation is much better. There are several grammars, also some, some written in German, dating back to the colonial past of uh, the Marianas and so on. There's a good reference grammar. I know that a new grammar is in the making at the moment. And so it's uh, a good situation for uh, uh, a language of uh, the Pacific, for instance. Um, it's, it's not a, a, a side issue only. People invest their time to study the language. Okay. And there are several interesting things. I did a research myself recently on the dual in, in Chamorro. So the expression, if two persons do something and many pay persons do something, you use different expressions. That's typically of, uh, in the Pacific, so many uh, languages uh, of the Pacific make a distinction between one person, two persons, and many persons doing something. You have to use different expressions. And Chamorro is very special. It's very special because you uh, use a combination. There's not a, um, a single dedicated expression for the two person doing something, but you use a combination, it is rather exceptional, worldwide, it's rather exceptional, you use uh, the expression, you use the, let's say, the pronoun for the many persons doing something, the plural, but you combine it with the singular verb form. So the verb form you, you would use uh, if only one person does something. And in the past, people believed that this, this is only possible with a certain class of verbs. But I was able to prove that it is also possible with the other class of verbs. It's hidden somewhere. It's very, very difficult to come across the really, uh, uh, let's say, convincing examples. So you have to study uh, many texts. And there aren't so many texts in Chamorro, except for the religious texts. There's... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, there's a shortage of uh, literature in a way, but even in this uh, small corpus of texts, you find evidence. And the funny thing is that what's happened, what is, can be shown to be the case in Chamorro, is practically unknown in the, the other Micronesian languages and also rel uh, uncommon uh, in uh, the Pacific. But you can find similar things only at one other place in, on the world map, 
and that is the southwest of the U.S. with uh, Uto Aztecan languages. Really? So that's Hopi, for instance. I thought you were going to say uh, Southeast Asia someplace. No, no, no. It's the other way, <laughs> yeah, the, the direction. <laughs> There is no historical uh, connection between the languages. It's what languages could do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But only two groups of languages. One of <laughs> group is Chamorro alone, and the other group is... Uh, Uh, belongs to the Uto Aztecan languages of the northern branch spoken in the US, Chemewevi, for instance, and Hopi, uh, and uh, Papago, uh, uh, Tohono Ohodam, uh, and so on, very small languages, um, North American Indian languages, in the way who, uh, where you find similar combinations of singular and plural to express the dual. Um, That you can't claim that these people are related to each other or something like this. It's simply a possibility that all languages could uh, take advantage of, but they, most of the languages don't do that. Just a tiny minority, and that makes Chamorros very, 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 very special. Well, you've given us a lot to think about, uh, to think about and now when I'm using a Chamorro verb, I'm going to be wondering, like, am I using the plural <laughs> pronoun with the singular verb and okay but um any final thoughts before you go yeah i, I hope that um I, the the results uh, the preliminary results of these uh, two projects will convince my university to f uh, further support our research and uh, if we can um add to our uh, uh, results by uh, during our next visit maybe sometime in 2019 Then uh, we can apply for uh, external funding with a German f f research funding uh, organization. And then perhaps there is money enough to also involve people here from uh, the Northern Marianas um, on a paid basis in a way. I can't promise anything, anything but uh, perhaps there is a possibility to, to also have somebody doing work here for the project uh, on, uh, on our payroll. Our guest today has been Professor Dr. Thomas Stolz of the University of Bremen in Germany. Thank you so much, Thomas. Thank you, Kath. This has been your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry. This program was supported by a We the People grant awarded to the Northern Marianas Humanities Council from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities or the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Mm -hmm.